Okay, welcome to lesson five. Uh, this lesson deals with the events between February 1917 and October 1917. And as you can tell from the picture here, those people aren't laying down of their own accord on the streets of Petrograd. The, um, things get, well, for lack of a better term, real. Very hip. <laughs> Very down with the children these days, aren't I? Yes. Lingo. All right. So as, as usual, I'm Mr. Rain and this is Mr. Souter. And the overview of this lesson is effectively as such. We have the provisional government in power. They have a legal power, but the real power really lies in the hands of the Petrograd Soviet operating behind the scenes and undermining them when it doesn't suit them. Now, the provisional government will try hard to deal with the problems of Russia, and the problems are many. Every problem that existed under the Tsar's reign, save for the fact that the Tsar himself was in power, will exist for the provisional government, coupled with the fact that they are still fighting World War I. In fact, one of the things we, all, we tend to forget is the fact that when the Russian Tsar abdicates in February or March 2nd, 1917, after the sort of February Revolution, Russia's still at war. They're still fighting the Germans, and thousands of Russian soldiers are getting killed every day on the on the Eastern Front fighting the Germans. So, um, the Rush, the provisional government, seems seemingly cannot deal with the major issues. Number one, peace, peace in the war, bread, uh, need for food, and land, land reform to give more of land to the Russian peasants. Uh, and of course, their inability to deal with these things make the Russian people increasingly angry between February and November 1917. As time goes on, of course, and these issues aren't dealt with, the socialist parties become more and more powerful and more and more violent. Now, just to recap, uh, don't forget that the provisional government is comprised of provisional uh, government is comprised of middle class liberals who take over after the Tsar. Uh, they represent only a small fraction of the Russian population. The overwhelming majority would find their allegiances or put their allegiances with the Petrograd Soviet. These are the sort of the unions of the working class and the soldiers. And the, these guys hold a lot of power as they have the support of that poor majority. And they also have control over the soldiers with the guns. He who has the weapons has the power. Uh, and as, of course, the provisional government is seen as only a temporary government, which was to run the country until elections can be held in November 1917 to um, put a new and lasting government in place to replace the Tsar. So, the three major issues facing Russia in 1917 were peace, bread, and land. Peace, whether they should stay in the war or make peace. The majority of poor Russians who were getting shot and stuff wanted to end it. However, the provisional government representing middle class liberals wanted to keep fighting. Some, for patriotic reasons, they didn't want Russia to look weak compared to other powers by surrendering out of nowhere. Some, for a bit more pragmatically, said that if Russia was to surrender straight away, the Germans would treat them really harshly. If the um, poor people make the Russian government um, commit peace, the, the Germans will know that the Russian government will have to do whatever um, the Germans asked them to do. So they will ask really harsh punishments, and in return, they would, the, the provisional government would have to say, yes, it's better to keep fighting, and maybe the war will be won on the Western Front, um, and therefore um, Russia will come out looking great and actually gaining land. So already, for over the issue of peace, the provisional government is thinking differently to the vast majority of Russians. The issue of bread as well, whether the, the price of bread should be reduced by forcing farmers, particularly the big farmers, the big landowners, and merchants, generally middle class merchants, to sell it at a set cheap price. So rather than a merchant go and buy some bread and come to the town and sell it for twice the price, he could only sell it for a certain amount of money. So far, so good. The poor love it. Cheap bread. Wonderful. The provisional government, because they are capitalists, because they are middle class, think that people should be allowed to sell food at whatever price they wanted. So they didn't want to get involved in making, forcing the bread to be sold at a certain price. That sounds too socialist for them. Finally, and this is a big one, the issue of the land. P um, the poor wanted the land for the rich, the rich have held, held masses of land for time immemorial to be given to the peasants. The government, because it's again it's capitalist, middle, uh, middle class, uh, Democrats, didn't think it had the power or wanted to take the land from the rich illegally without giving the money back and give it to the poor. Again, once again, the land issue shows that the um, middle class uh, provisional government is not in the, on the same page as the people. And what we'll see very quickly is the socialists who promise 
what people want to hear about peace, what people want to hear about bread, and what people want to hear about land become very popular very quickly. And as we'll see, the provisional government um, essentially ignores this desire to deal with the issues of peace, bread, and land. They try to avoid the, making a decision by saying, oh, don't worry, we will deal with it just when we've had the election. We haven't voted, remember, guys, we can't make that decision. That's just a delaying tactic. Most people they weren't bought off by that and as from this period from 1970 October so February to October every, at every point the more provisional government is getting more and more unpopular as these these demands for cheap bread end of the war and the land issue to be settled were ignored and socialists start persuading people more and more that the provisional government actually is doing this deliberately they're just as bad as they are they're trying to trick people into carrying on the war ignoring the land pressure and ignoring bread and they're just as bad so let me introduce the story a man most commonly known as lenin this is vladimir ulyanov um lenin is sort of his uh, stage name or his preferred name the name that's given to him as a revolutionary now Lenin, who we haven't done a lot of talking about, um, was a revolutionary from the outset. In fact, he comes from a family of revolutionaries from a particularly revolutionary part of Russia. Um, Lenin, during the time of the Tsar, is exiled for his political beliefs, which are very much anti-Tsar. And him and the, a lot, quite a few of the people in his quote-unquote Bolshevik party um, were actually exiled in Germany for the, um, for the duration of the First World War as to not ferment... Uh, uh, unrest. Uh, now, the Germans seize the opportunity to allow Lenin to return to Russia in April of 1916. And, of course, if you consider that the Russians and the Germans are facing each other and, uh, across a long line known as a front, the Germans actually allow R Lenin back into Russia so he can uh, encourage dissent, perhaps lead to a revolution and maybe get the Germans out of the war. And I guess in some, some aspects that's good strategy. The bottom line is when Lenin returns to Petrograd and arrives at Finland Station on the 16th of April 1917, he gives a speech where he presents the Bolshevik promise of what they would do if they were to seize power. Now the Bolsheviks are very much in as part of the Petrograd so Lenin calls for a fully socialist country to replace the provisional government and to get rid of any sort of notion of capitalism that exists in Russia at this point. He promises an end to the war, peace. He promises land for the peasants, land, and also rights for minorities. And then the key thing of the April thesis is all Lenin is doing here is saying, basically like a salesman, He's basically going, you remember that old provisional government which doesn't give us what we want? Well, I promise to do whatever you want and get sorted out and make life good for you again. All of this is political salesman thing. Shortly after the... Um after the April thesis, things start to go poorly and poorly. Of course, the, social, the, the Soviets gain more and more and more power, and anger towards a provisional government starts to boil over. Now, in what becomes known as the July days, um, the anger over what um, the anger over the course of the war becomes the big issue in Russia. Now, the Russians and the provisional government, when they're losing the war to the Germans, decide that it's absolutely best to go on an offensive. That sometimes the best defense again is a good offense. And they bet they literally spend or expend the lives of millions of, uh, of Russian casualties fighting the Germans in what most people are considering a lost and unnecessary war. And not to mention the fact that the economic issues dragged on. This leads, this uh, July, uh, or, sorry, June offensive leads to anger and resentment amongst the people, which results in a demonstration and rioting, particularly on the 3rd of July, with middle ranking Bolsheviks, including sailors from the local naval station at Kronstadt. Now, Kronstadt is a small island off the mouth of St. Petersburg, um, <clears throat> uh, beginning to organize against the, uh, against the provisional government. Though this wasn't organized by top Bolsheviks, the July days have uh, enormously damaging effects to the provisional government. So yeah, the key thing here is, is this random rising at the Ang is not instigated by any socialists. People are just angry, but increasingly Bolsheviks think this is an opportunity 
uh, as people are right on the street, to use these people to their advantage. It is not Lenin making the decision, it's people on the ground. And that's part of the problem, because uh, as we will see, that because this has just emerged and local Bolshevik leaders are pretty much making it as they go along, they're organising people, there's no real plan. The big leaders are not involved, so it's quite easy to crush by loyal soldiers. Interestingly, the soldiers who are loyal are other socialists. Many socialists, Mensheviks, social revolutionaries, see this, these Bolsheviks, who are only a small number of the people in Petrograd, and only a small number of um, socialists, as trying to take over and kick everyone else out. So they see Bolsheviks as a threat. So they decide, let's get rid of these guys. They didn't ask our permission to revolt. They didn't ask or tell us about it. So we'll just crush them and go back to the good old days to some extent. What happens, therefore, is Bolsheviks are arrested, the newspaper are closed, and Lenin once again has to flee Russia, this time hiding into Finland. Now, what one big change is, is because the socialists kind of save the day, the Mensheviks, the social revolutionaries save the day, and because it's quite clear that the people really hate the provisional government and the middle class dominated provisional government, the, the provisional government decide to get a socialist as prime minister. And for this task, they have, as you can see in the picture, they choose Kerensky, who is made prime minister on the 8th. The idea being, if they put a socialist in charge, the poor masses will think, finally, the government is on our side. Socialists will look after us. OK, I trust him and therefore there's no need to riot. So once again, what we see in the July days, although it doesn't quite work for the Bolsheviks, is a shift as the socialist Kerensky takes over. And as we'll see, unfortunately for the socialists at least, he turns out not to be a very good bet. OK, so quite a lot went on there. And let's just do a quick recap. So you have a situation where... Uh, Lenin returns in April, it ferments more discontent. Um, Russia goes on a, an offensive and an attack against Germany in the war. This is deeply unpopular. It leads to soldiers deserting and riots in the street in early July 1917. The riots are largely disorganized, but mostly led by the Bolsheviks and something, they, actually something they, they call the Red Guard. Now, the July days are put down by the provisional government and loyal soldiers. A lot of these loyal soldiers can be found in sort of the other groups that are against the Tsar. Um, the 400 people die in the July days, but the major result of it all is the fact that the other groups who are in the provisional government, the Bolsheviks are just one aspect of the provisional government. You have socialist revolutionaries, you have Mensheviks, you have cadets, you have a number of different other revolutionary groups, I'm sorry, in the Petrograd Soviet. These people decide that they don't necessarily like what the Bolsheviks are doing, so they decide to work with the provisional government to get these guys out. Lenin flees to Finland, uh, the new, their revolutionary newspapers are closed, Closed, but as a result, the provisional government, realizing how deeply unpopular it is, leans on the leader of the socialist revolutionaries, a man named Alexander Kerensky, to become the new prime minister in order to restore order. So, we now have the next event. Shortly after Kerensky's in power, he um, appoints a guy called General Kornlov in September 1917 to be the head of the army. However, Kerensky was misled. Kornlov is an aristocrat, um, a czarist of the old school. He's been now been put in charge of the army and he thinks this is his chance. I'm going to try and get rid of the socialists once and for all, bring back the czar, or at least bring back some sort of non-socialist government. Perhaps even a military dictatorship with him at the head. Or I'm sure that was well in his mind. What we see then is he therefore moves his army towards Petrograd in order to take over. Kerensky, who's just put Kornlov in power, panics. He's already looking bad because he's put the guy in power. It looks like it might even be a conspiracy. So he asks for help from anyone in Prince Petersburg. He wants the people, the poor, to defend it themselves and gave weapons to many of the poor. Amongst these poor working class peasantry in Petrograd who take up the weapons to defend are the Bolsheviks. These Bolsheviks who have laid low since July start, who are by far the best organised. They took the weapons and it, using their famed Red Guard, that's their, their military army, their private army, they defend Petrograd. They then keep the weapons. So what's happened here is Kerensky has panicked. He's given guns to anyone, including the Bolsheviks. And now the Bolsheviks have been the heroes and they've now got guns. 
Kornov very quickly is betrayed by his own men, who are mostly poor people, and arrested. But this has a profound political effect. Definitely. It, one of the major political effects of the Kornilov revolt is it basically makes the provisional government out to be weak. People absolutely begin to despise the provisional government. Um, Kerensky had appointed Kornilov. Kornilov had tried to seize power. Kerensky had had to go and use other forces to stop um, a, sort of a disaster of his own choosing. His reputation was utterly, utterly destroyed. And any sort of potential of the provisional government le um, uh, being led by Kerensky to, um, I guess, restore order and stability to Russia had basically gone out of the window. Now, the socialists who had worked with Kerensky, the socialist revolutionaries and the Mensheviks, were also discredited because they had created this situation uh, with General Kornilov. The Bolsheviks, again, too, end up armed. These people are, are dangerous revolutionaries. They've been provided guns by the weak Kerensky government, and they're ready and potentially in a better position to seize power themselves. Not to mention the fact that they're enormously popular. They were the ones seen to put down the Kornilov revolt, the ones who weren't working with the provisional government who's hated and detests, and the ones who, as I guess the one consistency throughout, is that they always remained against the czar and always remained against the provisional government. So they're not tainted by the, I guess, the stink of the provisional government and their ability, inability to solve the situations of peace, land, and bread. Now, by the end of September 1917, the Bolsheviks, in a, through a series of voting, get a majority in the Petrograd Soviet, which means that leading Bolsheviks can become the head of the Soviet and therefore make decisions on the base of uh, 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 for, for the entire thing. Now, this is enormously important because it basically means that in a sort of quasi-legal revolution, in a sense, the, the, the Bolsheviks are now in charge of Russia's destiny because, of course, the provisional government is being undermined thoroughly by the Petrograd Soviet at this entire time. The Bolsheviks will take over the Moscow Soviet as well and other Soviets. So they'll start to bring all of the different Soviets in the various large cities of Russia under their command. It's important to realise that despite the fact that they've got this majority, they're still not entirely in control. The provisional government, Kerensky, is still there. The Bolsheviks are now massively powerful. And the only reason that they got more votes and therefore elected, they got a majority in the Petrograd Soviet, was because of that, this factor that they were the saviours of the revolution. So, in summary, therefore, this whole period, we see the fact that the provisional government cannot deal with the issues of peace, bread and land, making the Russian poor, the Russian masses, increasingly angry. As they become angry, the Bolsheviks try and capture anger and say, if you don't like the provisional government, support us. This is clear from the April thesis. Although their attempts to take over in July days were not successful, the Kornilov revolt helped the Bolsheviks to become more powerful. They were now armed. Kerensky was now weakened. They were seen as saviours. This all sets the stage for what's going to happen in the next lesson period in October, where the Bolsheviks seize power against pretty much a government which no one really wants to defend. If people wanted to defend the, the government in October, as we'll see, the Bolsheviks would never have succeeded. But no one wanted to defend it because at this point, people hated it. So that puts an end to Lesson 5. I hope you enjoyed Mr. Souter and I as to walk you through the tumultuous days of February to October 1917, highlighted by, of course, the July days and the Kornilov Revolt. Uh, we look forward to speaking with you again in the interim. Be well.